An award winning winery in Israel, Shiloh Winery, makes some really delicious wines. We're going to check out more and hear more from the head winemaker there, Amichai Luri, in this 167th episode of The Jewish Drinking Show, bringing Lechaim to life. Lechaim. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Jewish Drinking Show. I'm very excited to have first time guests onto the show, Amichai Luria. Luria yes. to the show. Uh, we are at the winery where he is the vintner, head vintner, only vintner. Winemaker. Winemaker. I think vintner is the people that actually grow the grapes and work in the vineyards, uh -huh. which also that's something that, um, wow, very involved. Yeah. Because I'm uh, in the vineyards um, at least... I try to be at least once a week. Sometimes okay. it's every week and a half. See so the connection with the with the fam. <laughs> um, uh, much more than connection to the land, to the vineyards, but to the vintners, the people that actually yeah. grow our grapes for us. Yeah. Because um, the only way to make really good wine yeah. is to be involved with the land from literally planting the vines. Uh -huh. tending to them all year round and especially this season right before harvest uh -huh. and uh so, so it's really about having that connection to the whole process it's a yeah. it's a long journey it's a marathon so, <laughs> and, and it's uh it's even longer than you think because here in Eretz Israel when you plant a vineyard you first have a couple of years of orla but uh -huh. you can't pick the grapes yes and only then you pick the grapes and make wine. Mm -hmm. And even that, it's a long journey, right? Yeah. And from the day you even pick the grapes till the day you even bottle it, it's at least two years, sometimes even longer mm -hmm. than until it's ready. So it's a journey. Yeah, that's a real, but, uh, it's a long process. Yeah. So Luria here is the winemaker here at Shiloh Winery. And how long have you been with Shiloh? I think it's about 18 years. It's from oh, wow. Were you like the founding winemaker? There was somebody, the the owner of the winery, uh -huh. Dr. Meir Shomer, uh -huh. lives in Mexico. Uh, he established the winery. He's the owner of the winery. Wow. I, he brought me over uh -huh. a couple of months after they started. Uh -huh. And uh, I've been here from the harvest of 2005 until wow. now. So you said, time. but almost the beginning. So it was started in he 2005? He started in 2005 vintage. Uh -huh. And uh, towards that vintage, a little bit after the first vintage, he asked me to uh, uh -huh. come on board. So and nearly since the, the beginning. Yeah, so nearly. Yes, yes. Yeah. wow. That's yeah. a good chunk. How did you, before coming here, were you making wine elsewhere? So How wine, did you get into it? <laughs> so wine... Making wine, uh -huh. among other things, has been a hobby of mine and my wife's. Uh -huh. We've been uh, making wine before that for yeah. years at our home, small amounts as a hobby. And uh -huh. as you know, when you do something as a hobby, so you take things to the extreme, right? Because <laughs> it's already a hobby, then yeah. let's do it all the way. Right. Right. And uh, we learned on our own. Yeah. And every time you, when you do something as hobbies, you always try to see how I can do better and yeah. more perfect and whatever. And yeah. even more than that, um, when it's not your profession, yeah. then you can do things, uh, take chances, do things with your intuition, do things a little bit different. Uh -huh. And uh, it turned out that a lot of the things that we decided to do that are unconventional, uh -huh. uh, turned out to be major successes. Uh -huh. And uh, I can actually say that today we do a lot of things at the winery that are unconventional, but uh -huh. it works and the results are amazing. So why not do on a large scale what we were doing on a very small scale? I met uh, Maeve yeah. and he said, why don't you turn a hobby into a profession? And I thought, oh, making wine is so much fun <laughs> when you do it as a hobby, right? Uh -huh. I didn't understand that how demanding and how uh, challenging it is to do it in the largest scales. And also the, the stakes are much higher yeah. because, you know, it has to succeed, it has to work. And right. uh, since then, I'm here. Off, off camera, before we yeah. start recording, talk about how big production has gotten in recent years. Mm -hmm. What about those first few years? What was it like 
And can you give a sense of the over these past 18 or so years, the growth? What, what was the size of it in the outset and how did the growth occur? So we started at about 40,000 bottles a year. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, we thought that everything would stay very small, very boutique and everything. Was and that, that the intention to be smaller? And uh, yes, the intention was maybe to grow to around 70,000, maybe, maybe to get to 100,000 and it would be also better as a business. Uh -huh. And that was our main goal at the beginning, yeah. around 100,000 bottles a year. Uh -huh. And every year we grew a little bit, but uh, we saw that the demand from the market is much higher. Uh -huh. And uh, we've been growing ever since. I have to say that the growth was always, I had like a condition. I mean, I'm willing to grow, but I still have to be hands-on, right? Yeah. Everything. And that's why we grew gradually because I didn't want the growth to be in the expense of the quality. That means I wanted uh -huh. to continue to do just as good and try to improve every single year. Yeah but also to grow with the quantity. Yeah. And we got in the previous uh, place before we moved into the new facility, more or less to a limit to where we couldn't grow anymore without it being an expense of the work. And mm -hmm. now when we, when finally we planned and built uh, the new winery, mm -hmm. everything was planned in a way that I can grow, but still be hands-on. Like uh -huh. I'll give you an example. Yeah. When when we, during the harvest season, um, I have to be at least once a day on every tank that's fermenting, mm. mix it, pump over, check the wine. I, mean, I won't do any compromises because there, oh. there are small decisions that I think make a big difference, mm. especially during harvest season. That yeah. The only way to do it is to be literally get your hands dirty, mm. pump over the tank, smell it, taste it. And there's a limit to how much you can do in a small facility where you're running from one tank to the other with a ladder and everything. Here, everything is built in a way that I can do that much more and better with that much less time. Uh -huh. So I have a catwalk. I can do seven tanks in the time that it used to take me to do one tank and really? better. Oh, wow. And everything is in, like, like, I don't have to run down, turn on the pump, go back up, and everything, like, I turn on my phone, okay, turn on the pump, start working, turn it off, take a sample, taste it, turn it back on. Everything is can be much easier than running up and down a ladder, having two people helping me from far away. Yeah. And the main goal and the main focus, let's be honest, there's a lot, a lot of good kosher wine out there today. All today. around today, all around the world. <laughs> years ago, ago yeah. years ago, it was much easier to stand out. Okay, uh -huh. today to stand out and to show that you can do something really good. There's a lot, a lot of good competition out there uh -huh. making really good wine. So if you don't go to the extreme, if you're not willing <laughs> to do every little thing just a little bit better, like somebody asked me about something that we do here in the winery. Uh -huh. I said to him, I have a gadget that I can do a certain thing every 45 minutes for two minutes. I have a gadget. I can just mm -hmm. assist me. Does it make a big difference? I said, no. It makes a very small difference. So why do you do it? Because that makes a small difference and that makes a small difference. Uh -huh. And that makes a, all these things put together yeah. actually make a difference in the one. That way you can come out with new wines, with new things, to come out with a better wine the year after, which yeah. is a big challenge. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode featuring Amichai Luri. Of course, if you enjoy having L'chaims, you probably also say L'chaim. What does that mean? Where does it come from? Well, that's that's uh, something we're going to check out next week with Do Rabbi Dr. Tzvi Ronan here is a sneak peek into that episode. If the guy, as he wants to say Kiddush, is scared of poison in the cup, he says Sovri Maranan, and what does the whole audience say? I hope you enjoy that sneak peek, and I hope you come back next week to check out a full episode with Rabbi Dr. Tzvi Ron. Now back into this week's episode featuring Amichai Lori. But how would you describe anything distinct about Shiloh Wines? In addition to where we are and your involvement, if in maybe a nutshell, the brand and, and sort of what do you bring to sort of the, sort of the niche or the, the branding of Shiloh Wines? So Chilo Winery, from day one, we always tried to 
not just make really high quality wines, but also be true to, to the variety, mm -hmm. but also to do things a little bit different. So if you take, for example, our Cabernet Secret Reserve, mm -hmm. it's one of the best Cabernet, kosher Cabernets sold out there. We also sell a lot of it to the non-kosher market because I think that we're not just, it's a consistently year after year, really, really high quality Cabernet. And to compete in a, in a variety that almost everybody makes, it makes it even yeah. more challenging. Yeah. And if you taste it, you understand that it's a special wine. And wow. year after year, it's a special wine. That said, we also try to be, do things different than everybody else does. Like we have single varieties like a Petit Verdot, mm -hmm. a Petit Syrah, a uh, Cabernet Franc, uh, a Barbera that's totally different and very, very few kosher uh, Israeli wines make a high quality uh, Barbera wine. So on the one hand, we want to surprise and do things special and do things different. Yeah. On the other side, we, when we do something that's mainstream, we want to do it that much better. Mm -hmm. And consistently, year after year, not to disappoint anybody. And it's very challenging yeah. to, uh, almost everybody can make a one-time really great wine. Mm -hmm. But to be consistent that year after year, the wine is just as good as the previous year. And tell you that we do, you saw the, the tasting, I think we do so many tasting and blending of the wines. And... We have a saying at the winery, Notnim layain le daber. That means we let the wine speak. Mm -hmm. That means the wine decides. So if let's say the demand in the market is for me to make 20,000 bottles of Barbera, but let's be honest, to make the high quality good Barbera that I do, this year I can only do 8,000 bottles. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what everybody wants. We let the wine decide what's going to happen. That means we don't compromise on quality. If I can make a certain wine on a certain quality, I can make only a certain amount, that's what it'll be. Even if I'll be sold out in two hours, also I'll be sold out in two weeks, and I won't have enough for the whole year. So we see the Shiloh, and it looks like it's, I don't so, know, an ox or something? So <laughs> because uh, she, the name the winery is named Shiloh because we're in, in Shiloh, Shiloh, right? Yeah. Shiloh is ancient, right? Mm -hmm. 3,000 years ago. This is where basically we everything started. Oh, we could say that we were forged in the desert, right? Mm -hmm. Am Yisrael was forged and molded and became an Am, became a nation in, uh, in the desert. Mm -hmm. But when we came, finally came into Eretz Israel um, uh, after, I don't know, we got lost in the desert for 40 years, right? We didn't have ways then and whatever. <laughs> uh, we came into Eretz Israel, the place where we were stationed for 369 years. This is where the Mishkan was. We're talking about mm. before Yerushalayim, before King David uh, was here in Shiloh. Actually, the archaeology site is right here, nearby. Wow. Yeah, uh, you have to go. It's amazing to see huh. what's going on there. Uh, they've been still they they've been digging the archaeology site there for over a hundred years, again and mm. again. Amazing findings, even now. Mm. They just found not a long time ago one of Karnota Mizbeach. There, there are a oh, lot wow. of amazing amazing stories. If you want, you can go into. It. Wow. Find all around this area and ancient wine presses that date back to Yoshua Binun, right? Mm -hmm. they to Elia Cohen, mm -hmm. right? To Shmuel Navi. This is where Shmuel Navi started. This is where Chana and Pnina mm -hmm. and Elkanah were here, right? Mm -hmm. This is we we learned the halachot of Shmona Israel from the way Chana mm -hmm. davened here. Everything was here, and uh, there are stories uh, in uh, in Shmuel about uh, about uh, in, in Yoshua about vines that were vineyards that were here mm -hmm. thousands of years ago. So it makes mm -hmm. sense to to do it here, especially that there are literally many prophecies from almost every prophet speaking about. Uh, 
the Geula, and speaking about replanting and uh, rebuilding this area, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you have to be blind not to see prophecies coming to life mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. walking around this area today. Dr. Shomer, is that his name? Yeah, Meir Shomer. Meir Shomer. So, uh, how did he decide to set it up here so, in Shiloh? There's so, a biblical connection? It, yes, 100%. You know, it's like uh, if you're looking for a place, where did our ancestors grow grapes, make wine? You had to bring wine to, for Avodata Mishkan, Avodata Mikdash. Mm -hmm. The Mishkan was here. You need wine, so you planted grapes. Mm -hmm. You made wine here to bring to the Mishkan. Yeah. Right? Elia Kohen, when he saw Chana mumbling, mm -hmm. right? So she said, What are you, you're drunk? Did you drink? Yeah. And, and she said, No. I mean, she said, Because she has no child, then she was um, weeping. And davening and asking yeah. Kodesh Baruch Hu. Yeah. So it's, everything is like, you know, to, to be a Jew, you're surrounded with wine. Mm -hmm. From when you're eight days old, you get your first sip. But, uh, you know, you, Shabbos starts, Shabbos ends, every Simcha, every Yom Tov, uh, we have wine. So it makes sense that around the Mishkan, they grew grapes. And uh, for, for Meir to pick the perfect Mm -hmm. ideal place was to do it here and uh, what's with the animal here so the we're in uh, this area is a uh, part of Shevet Yosef which is a Ephraim and Menashe mm -hmm. actually one of our vineyards you can actually see the border of Ephraim and Menashe in, uh -huh. in Chavad Givot Olam um, for those who are not familiar with the, the Hebrew it's Yosef and Menashe, you said? Ephraim and Menashe uh, Ephraim split and Menashe from, from Yosef, Yosef, right? They're tribes sure. of the descendants of Yosef. Right, and one of the one of the blessings says like this, Bechol shoro hadar lo vekarame reim karna, right? Mm. And Breshit? Uh, uh, in Yosef, Vezot Abracha. This is just the end of the Right. right. You know, sometimes it's like when you memorize a phone number in Hebrew, you have to say it in Hebrew, in English, you have to say it. In English. <laughs> uh, you have to figure out where it is. You have to mumble the tamim, and then, and then you realize where it is. So yeah. that's why I was mumbling before, right? So, it's the so, it's, it's, so that's it, why Bechol Shoah the, in Degel Machane Ephraim was uh, uh, was the, the the flag, the symbol of the tribe, the Sefer Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Um, was the symbol of the bull or mm. Karanera M, and that's why we wanted, like you can see a lot of things that have to do with the Shiloh Winery. We try to stay connected as much as possible to the... So I do see... So you the, see the Mishkan here. Yeah, that's really and they good. Have I have seen vineyards. many wine bottles with a Mishkan with a tabernacle right. in it. Right. And yeah. the vi vines are, it uh, says, uh, the, the vines are, it says the word Sod. Oh. Right? Right? <laughs> yeah. Why is it called secret reserve or called the uh, sod? Secret in uh, uh, sod in in, in, in gematria is yain, right? Mm -hmm. Nichnas yain yetsa sod. Yeah. So every little thing we do, we try to stay right. close to our uh, to to, to right. our masoret, right? Uh -huh. For example, take the privilege on the label. It says like this: Yecheskel uh, lamedvav chet. Mm -hmm. Right, Ezekiel, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Thirty-six, eight. Well, um, what, what, what does that come from? So, I was, I was shocked when we started making this wine years ago. Yeah, that Christians came in, saw Ezekiel thirty-six, eight, boom, <laughs> recited it yeah. like that. Jews have to, most Jews, okay, have yeah. to look it up. So what what is it basically what does the Pasuk say or the prophet, the Navi Cheska says, um, in the prophecy of what's gonna happen, it says, Vatem Hare Israel, the hills, the mountains of Israel, mm -hmm. an pechem titnu, mm -hmm. 
the, the shoot, the branches, will, will give branches, mm-hmm. and you will like carry the branches, will mm-hmm. carry the fruit. Yeah. Le Israel, for the sons of Israel, ki karvu lavo, because you're about to come. Hey there, I want to break in yet again. Although I ask for support in financial ways because it does cost some money to make the hosting happen and other aspects of Jewish drinking happen. So your financial support is definitely appreciated. And don't forget, you can go to jewishdrinking.com slash donate. But also another way of supporting the show and everything that Jewish drinking does is also to tell your friends, tell your neighbors. If you like this content, if you like this show, maybe people you know also like it. So feel free to let them know, hey, I have this interesting episode I heard, or a few episodes, or whatever it is, or even a few clips. Feel free to share with your friends. All right, thank you so much. Now back into the show. You would think and you would expect and you understand that the Arabs are telling you that for them in their eyes, it makes no difference between this side or that side. They want to kill you here and they want to kill you there. It doesn't matter. They want to, they want you totally exterminated. They don't even want to, they don't want to kick you out of Israel. It doesn't matter if you live in Tel Aviv or you live here at the, look at Aza, all that, all those communities next to Aza, that's inside the green line, what you would call, right? Mm-hmm. So did they do, insane things that they did there. Yes, take care if it's this side of the green line, or that side of the green line, makes no, makes no difference. Before 67, before we finally got our homeland, Judea, I mean, this is our land, this is where our ancestors live, this is where we find archaeology sites of our people here, this is our home, mm-hmm. people don't, uh, if, if people still want to boycott us, I don't want their business, you understand, I, I don't need them to buy my wine. If you really seriously think that a wine made in Tel Aviv is okay, but a wine made in Shiloh or in, in Yerushalayim is bad, I don't want you to buy my wine, I'm not, mm-hmm. I don't need it either, I'll be, be honest with you, thank God. We're making enough wine, we're selling enough wine. People want to come here. I can't ignore where we are, which is this new facility of yours. And you had spent, off camera, you spoke to me about intending to have open work to be done on it immediately after Sukkot, and then throughout the rest of the fall into the winter, opening this place up here. Uh, clearly, events outside of your power happened. So, so basically we're, we're, what happened, it's, it's really great to see it. It's very exciting, but it's clearly not yet totally all the way there open. Right. Uh, so what we did was uh, before the harvest, yeah. which was last August, okay, yeah. uh, our main goal was to move into the new facility to produce wine here. And mm-hmm. thank God it worked. And the facility worked and we made close to half a million bottles, which most of them are still in mm-hmm. In, you were able to uh, in move barrels. This stuff in, in so August we moved in before August. Oh, before August, before, right before August. Oh, wow. And we did the harvest here. Oh. That said, the visitor center oh, wow. and the offices uh, and everything over there were were supposed to be done by Hanukkah, which is was December, November, December. Uh, end of November, December, something. Yeah. Obviously, uh, in the middle of the harvest of 2023, towards the end. We're towards the end. Simchat Torah. Simchat Torah. It doesn't. It's gonna, it's going to be challenging for many many years that Simchat uh, mm-hmm. Torah, right? Yeah. Um, Wait, so, uh, so then this, we didn't so move into the visitor center, and until today, uh-huh. we're still struggling to finish the visitor center because everything here was built. The whole facility here, 100% from top to bottom, was 100% Jewish labor. That means we didn't, Arabs weren't allowed to come into the facility here to build Mm -hmm. the winery at all. That means even this truck driver that brought in the, to pour the concrete had to be Jewish. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the year, year and a half that we were building the facility and people would come and see the hole being, the cellar being dug up or the, 
construction or electricity or people welding and everything. And you see people or everybody is, why aren't you using Arab labor? Why are you doing this? I'm saying to people, listen, it's a known fact, just people, not everybody's willing to admit it. They come, they work here, they take down notes, they go back to the Palestinian Authority or to the Hamas, and they give information and they get another $50 per day or another extra. <laughs> And eventually they're going to come for us. And if you don't see that, then you have no idea what you're talking about. Wow. The couple of weeks after the war broke out, yeah. I'm not exaggerating. I must have got hundreds of phone calls and WhatsApp messages from friends yeah. that came to visit here. Remember that we laughed at you last year and the previous year that you're doing it more expensive and more difficult and you're only using Jewish labor. Why aren't you using Arabs for, to build the place and everything? I and unfortunately, we saw exactly what uh, they were wow. planning and what they have been planning for a hundred years already, okay? Yeah. It didn't start now, okay? Yeah. Haj Amin al Husseini, right, mm -hmm. met uh, Hitler, and mm -hmm. they, they, they've been planning this forever. There's nothing new. Yeah. It's just we don't are our hard for us to mm. see reality in the face. Wow. You know, with, uh, so you already had an open... The so production was already production running. Production was running. 2023, we did uh -huh. it here. Uh -huh. We actually harvested over 150 tons of grapes after the war broke out. Obviously, with the. the so the how state, did you with, do that? Because you mentioned <laughs> all Jewish labor, so you so, didn't have workers then. So right? all my all my workers were called up on Simchat Torah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I was left with only two people. Mm -hmm. And don't forget also all the vintners and growers, yeah. also they were called up. Uh -huh. So it took us a couple of weeks to finish the harvest. It was yeah. extremely challenging. I was always the youngest guy in the field. I'm 58 years old, <laughs> going on 59, very close. Yeah. And uh, all the people that were working in the, in the vineyards with me to finish the harvest, we're in their 60s, 70s, and like I said to you, people that were already 80 years old were yeah. there working. Uh, it was extremely challenging, but Baruch Hashem, most of the vineyards we were able to harvest at the end. Also here, it was really, really hard to get everything done, but thank God because it, we were in a new facility and everything was that, is that much easier than it used to be. Huh. So I have more space and uh, more equipment and everything is automatic, a lot of things. So somehow me and my youngest son and my right-hand guy that was, that's was been with me for many years here, yeah. the three of us were somehow able to finish the harvest. Wow. And don't forget, right after the harvest, there's a lot of work to do, right? Uh -huh. Getting everything to barrels, bottling the previous year. So everything took much longer than we used to. Huh. Baruch Hashem, in general, I can say that uh, everything, although things happened a little bit later than usual, but still when we taste the wines, everything is fine. Oh, great. Everything's okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, some things we weren't able to do, we were planning to do. There was a big harvest, Motzei Simchat Torah, that didn't happen, and we weren't even able to go into the vineyard uh, at all, so we lost a couple of vineyards. Eh. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, it's been, uh, can I say, it's not just challenging the work, it's also, it's in our, our main vineyard in, uh, in Givot Olam in Itamar. Mm -hmm. um, one of the brothers was killed on the first day. Oh, wow. He was Or Yosef Ran. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was the commander of the Yechidat Siur in Duvdevan. Hmm. He actually put the unit together years ago. Hmm. He actually came, took off a couple of hours, Motzei Yom Kippur, to come help us in his family's vineyard to harvest Motzei Yom Kippur. It was the last time I saw him. Huh. <sighs> Breaks my heart to say that... Uh, I saw him and some of his brothers and sisters didn't see him the months before. Mm. Uh, and uh, privileged to work with his family for years. Mm. 
Uh, actually, we're now preparing for the upcoming harvest. It's supposed to start any day now without him. And yeah. uh, hmm. we lost a lot, a lot of good friends. Uh, uh, this past year, it's insane. We, we adopted a special here at the winery. Yeah. Over 15 years ago, we adopted a special unit in an army that in the first couple of days lost nine people and uh, that, that we know, I mean, really almost lived here at the winery, was so close to them. Wow. And uh, two other people that were killed uh, lately. Uh, one of them was Arnon that was part of the rescuing the last, uh, not this one, the previous, the, and they brought back some of the hostages. Yeah. And he was killed during that rescue. And uh, I don't know, it's like, I'm embarrassed to say that uh, after a couple of weeks of the beginning of the war, I stopped going to Shiva houses and mm. stopped going to funerals. I, I just, yeah. Um, and uh, it's, it's, mm. it, Everyone is a is is a whole world, right? And but when it's so many, so many people that you know, so many friends of mine that lost their children, mm -hmm. it's like. I, I mean, I know this kid since he was born. I know this mm. guy. I've known him for thirty years, forty years. Just lost his child. I know this lady just lost her son. It's like, wow. and it's just again and again and again and again. It's mm -hmm. like. You don't see the end of it. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, listen, I just had most of my team just got back from the army now. They were listed up until now. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, and everybody is on standby, you know. <laughs> yeah. We had, they released some of my guys right after Pulim, and they were mm. supposed to be released. And like yeah. a couple of days later, like... <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the day, they drop everything and ran back. It was uh -huh. like, uh, so it, do you? Is it an uncertain upcoming harvest this month, or because I, I know you said some it, guys just are getting now released, so there's a room for optimism. They'll be here to help with the harvest, but like you said, it's it's not like things are cooling down right now. So, is there a concern they may just again on a moment's notice be called up? So, you know, you try to prepare, but you really can't, okay? Yeah. But uh, at the moment, if things stay how they are, yeah. then even with that I don't have a full crew, mm -hmm. uh, the Zat things will be okay. okay. In the vineyards, again, also there, the, the vintners got things done a little bit later. Not everything was done on time, but everything's yeah. okay. Yeah. Uh, thank God for uh, years ago, we decided gradually, even though we're a boutique high end winery mm -hmm. and try to make the best wines we can, we've proven that uh, doing uh, machine harvest in the middle of the night is better than hand picking first thing in the morning. Really? And we did this, we, we did experiments for years yeah. and then slowly we, we moved there. So huh. basically I can get that much more done in less time wow. so actually it means that unfortunately i do uh at least 40 nights a, a year i'm working all night and then working all day but at least i can get that much more done with a better quality and huh. uh so even though some of my vintners unfortunately some of my growers aren't with us today so uh -huh. i wow. think it's like one of them is buried between the vineyards, so it's like, you can't miss it. I'm there once a week, okay? wow. and I'm a coin, so I'm like walking. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but wow. unless there's a major escalation, uh, then uh, this harvest will, will be able to do it hopefully even better than the last harvest. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of vineyards, so it's looking that this harvest will be a smaller one than last year because some we can't get into because the army didn't let us do anything. We didn't even prune the grapes. We can't go in there. Some of them were burnt with uh, missiles from Hezbollah. Um, 
some uh, we didn't get water to, couldn't get fix the pipes, there was no vintners to work because everybody's in the army, so we lost the crop this year. Wow. So we're, we're at least uh, in quantity, I'd say we're anywhere between 20 and 30 percent lower mm -hmm. than last year. Bezat uh, Hashem, somehow the yield will be better <laughs> and more and it'll make up but we're not sure you know i'm always surprised when i when i hit the sixth year the year before shemitah that says uh -huh. and we're always surprised even though kaddish Baruch Hu promises us yeah but we're always amazed how the yield is higher but the quality is better and for somehow there's more room in the barrels <laughs> and in the tanks and then when we summarize everything up wait a second the numbers don't add up to how do i have so much wine when i did <laughs> and then okay that's great so we always try to look it's it's getting more and more challenging and difficult to look on the bright side mm. to see that uh, it doesn't matter if the glass is half full or half empty i still have a bottle next to it i can refill right <laughs> but uh huh. i don't know what is one thing you'd like to promote so i think um i think one of the big surprises in the past couple of years that we've been making is in the Secret Reserve series, we have two wines, a Petit Verdot Secret Reserve and a Petit Syrah Secret Reserve. Those are wines that are extremely difficult to make as a single varietal for it to be, wow, amazing wine. And I think those two wines have a few things that make them special. First of all, they're the perfect food, wine for food. Mm. The perfect, I mean, it, it, I can talk about it forever, <laughs> but it doesn't matter what you're having to eat. Take a Petit Verdot Seeker Reserve, take a Petit Sia Seeker Reserve, you'll see how much it'll make the food that much better and how much the food will make the wine better. And L'chaim. L'chaim.